Anyway, I'd like for you to open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. Kurt and I were talking before the service that how whenever you sub, you vacillate on what it is you should teach. You're like, no, I'm going to do this. No, I'm going to do And you go back and forth. And I, this one I had wanted to do. I told Paul Flanagan a while back that if, if I ever teach for Pastor John again, I'm doing 1 Peter 1. But I've been going through the Old Testament really slowly. I just got to Joshua. And I've been having things where God gives me these messages that go through my mind. So I stop and I start putting the message together. So I had like five messages. So when it came time, I thought, well, let me look over these other ones. And I'm like, no, that one wouldn't fit. No. But then it came to one. I'm like, yeah, this, this is pretty awesome. Lord really kind of speaking to me. I went through the whole thing, got it all worked up. Then next morning I said, well, let me look at that first Peter chapter one again. And I looked and I said, okay, never mind. I'm doing 1 Peter chapter 1. This is what the Lord wants me to do. So I thought, quit thinking about any of the others. Just stick with it. So 1 Peter chapter 1. I really hope it's a blessing. I know when I originally studied this that it really moved me. That um, there's times as, as the Lord was speaking to me. I mean, I was just in tears. I was just going through this. So I hope this really blesses you, encourages you, and just uh, speaks to your heart as we as Christians, because this is really speaking to Christians tonight. So in 1 Peter chapter 1, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So most of us know when we use the word apostle, it means one sent out. And the closest thing that we have today would be a missionary. We don't really have apostles. There's a group trying to bring that back. But... Uh, the problem is they're trying to elevate themselves to the actual level of the original 12 apostles. And hey, to me, that's just what we're seeing in the New Testament as far as false apostles. So because apostles back in Peter's time, what it was, they had to be someone who had uh, actually witnessed of the resurrected Jesus to be chosen by the Holy Spirit and had the ability to perform signs and wonders. Now, the area that he's talking about when he's speaking of these people and where they've been uh, dispersed, it, it's what we think of as modern-day Turkey. And I'm not sure how they come up with the name of a country called Turkey, you know. Be like, yeah, it's next to the country chicken, you know. It's like, how do you come up with Turkey? But it talks about here to the pilgrims. So I don't know what goes through your mind when you think of pilgrims. I know if Scott is watching, he's probably thinking of John Wayne right now because... I really can't say anything because that's what I'm thinking, John Wayne, a pilgrim. But when you think about a pilgrim, what you're really talking about is someone who, they're really just passing through. They're not residents of that country. They were being dispersed to a place that was not their own. There wasn't their land. And all of us as Christians, really that's what we are. We're pilgrims in this world. We do not fit in this world. Once we came to know Jesus Christ as our Savior, this is a foreign place to us. We are looking for a city whose maker is not made with human hands. So we're all pilgrims, just, you know, for the most part. So we're strangers dispersed. And the thing that's different about this, you know, in the book before this, you have the book of James, and they're talking to uh, a dispersed of Jewish Christians who, through the, um, the uh, persecution of the church of Jerusalem, moved into a different area. Here we believe that Peter is speaking to Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. And the thing about Peter was is that he was really the person who began the movement for Jesus Christ to the Jews, to the Samaritans, and to the Gentiles. He pretty much was fulfilling the Great Commission. So we go on to verse 2. And by the way, Turkey at this time was under the Roman Empire, these places that are mentioned. So in verse 2 it says, to the elect according of the foreknowledge of God the Father and sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. By the way, we're in 1 Peter chapter 1 since I don't have anything posted up here. That's not my thing, you know. Paul's always like, Brian, you got anything posted? I'm like, hey, I'm not in school and I'm not doing homework. I'm just going to get up here. <laughs> so 1 Peter chapter 1. 
But uh, we see this word elect, and many people say it relates to the word chosen. And some people can think, okay, this is the foreknowledge of God. We know God knows everything. He knows everything's going to happen. But when we're looking at this, it's not like God's up there saying, okay, I want you, I want you, I don't want you, I want... It's not that. Peter was using this word chosen or elect as something special to these people who are being dispersed. And being special is kind of like you thinking of yourself as a Christian. I know Paul, last night when we were all together, he mentioned this in his prayer, but we are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. And when we think about it, you think, you know what, I may think there's not much about me. I'm not that talented. You know, there's nothing special about me. But then all of a sudden somebody tells you, you know what, you are an ambassador of Jesus Christ. And so you start thinking about it, you know what, I am special. I'm special to God. And I have a purpose. And as an ambassador, what I'm trying to do is draw people to the kingdom of God. So that's what he was trying to do there. And then we see in this verse, when it says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, we see the entire Trinity all in this one verse. We know that we are saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. We know that we're sanctified and set apart by the Holy Spirit. Pastor John talked about this on Sunday. So we see the whole thing just coming together. And when you see the sprinkling of the blood, actually that refers to um, Exodus chapter 24, I believe it is, verse 4 through 8. I'm not going to get into that. You can do that for homework. <coughs> Pastor John would appreciate that. I just gave you homework. <laughs> One night, this was months ago, he was rattling off, like, okay, when you get home for homework, read this. Then he said something else. Hi, Pastor John. And then he said something else. And me and Tomas were outside, we were talking. I said, Tomas, I'd like to talk to you, but I got a lot of homework. I got to get home. And Tomas goes, yeah, brother, I got a lot of homework too. I need to go. We thought, man, we're going to be up a long time. <clears throat> but we know that we weren't sprinkled by the blood, that we were washed by the blood. Jesus poured out every drop of his blood for us. So also what we look at here when we think about this is that... Um, that we are to make a difference while we're in this world. Like they were chosen, they were elect, we are too, we're ambassadors, all of us, we all are representatives of Jesus Christ. And if we're not being sanctified, if we're not being set apart because of our disobedience to the leading of the Holy Spirit, then we're not going to be doing what we're supposed to be doing for Jesus Christ. And if we're not doing that, what is the point of us even being on this earth? So, the thing is, is when you're really living for the Lord, you're really doing something, you feel like you're really being used for God, that is when you really feel alive. If you ever start feeling worthless and dead, ask yourself, am I connected to the Lord? Am I living for Him? Am I serving? Am I trying to be in His will and do His will? Because if you're not being sanctified and set apart, you're going to have some issues. You're going to have some problems as a Christian. So it's very important that we do that. Then at the very end there it says, Grace to you and peace be multiplied. That was a common greeting to Christians. Grace was the Greek. Uh, peace was the Hebrew. And the Greek is uh, charis, which we get the word charisma. You know, Brian's got a lot of charisma, you know. Not really, but... <laughs> so you have charis and shalom. And I kind of like that. You know, if we want to act like, you know, we're really intelligent, just... Hey, Chris and Shalom. So, Chris and Shalom to the body of Calvary Chapel, Flower Mound, wherever you are. I like, I mean, to me that sounds good, Chris and Shalom. <clears throat> but, verse 3. So it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So it says we have this living hope. Why do we have a living hope? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, as you've heard before, the resurrection, I mean, that's the difference maker between all other religions, whatever you want to call them. I mean, I hear, I hear people say that, well, the, all religions are the same. And I'm like, 
How can you get that? I mean, there's no other religion that has God came down to earth in the form of a man, died on a cross for your sins, was buried, rose again, and then ascended back up to the home, the heavenly home he came from. God came down as man. Man is, in any other religion, is trying to become God. They're trying to get their way up there. But God came down as man so that man had a way to get back up to God in his heavenly home. And, you know, we can say, yeah, you know, the religions have certain philosophies like how to treat people. Well, fine. But if you don't have a resurrected Savior, you don't have anything. That is the whole difference. If Jesus himself does not resurrect, we have nothing. We all know that. So, and when you think about that, You realize that these disciples that were following Jesus for these three and a half years, they didn't realize what Jesus was going to be going through and the fact that he was going to be going through incredible suffering. He was going to give his life on the cross. He was going to be buried. He was going to resurrect. They didn't realize that. I mean, it, even in John, it tells us they were sad. It also tells us that, uh, that Peter said, hey, this isn't going to happen. And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. We know that in John that they were hiding for fear of the Jews because they were not expecting a resurrection. And what happened at that moment is they had a dead hope. They didn't have a living hope. And when Jesus walked into the room, when they saw the resurrected Jesus, that's when their dead hope became a living hope. The same with us. We had a dead hope. We were hopeless. You know, you know that. You remember that. You had no hope until you realize what Jesus did for you in his death, burial, and resurrection. And that's what's happening with these pilgrims. Peter's trying to get them to understand, listen, you guys have a living hope. I know you've been dispersed, but you are chosen. You are special. And you have a living hope because of the resurrected Jesus. You know, 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Hey, because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we put our faith in Him for that, we've went from no hope to living hope. And let me tell you, Peter can speak to this. You know, Peter went to the grave with John and saw Jesus wasn't there. He saw a resurrected Jesus. He was restored by Jesus. He saw Jesus ascend into heaven. He saw all this. He had a living hope. He saw it in person. And he's speaking about it right here. So, you know, when Jesus met Peter for the, one of the last times, they were out fishing. And Jesus came up on the shore, and they eventually came on the shore too. And one of the things that Jesus told Peter was that, Peter, you are going to die for this message of the death, burial, and resurrection of me, of Jesus Christ. And, G and Peter, he really didn't, you know, he's like, all right. I mean, yes, it hit him. It probably took him back for a second, but... He went on and did exactly that and knowing that he was going to lose his life because he had a hope and a future. He knew that when something happened to him, he knew where he was going to be. Because once he saw a resurrected Jesus, he knew everything that Jesus had taught him was true. He knew when Jesus said, I'm going back to the Father, I'm preparing a place for you, you're going to be there son. He knew it was true, it was going to happen. I would hate to be in a point where I could say I have no hope. I wouldn't want to be there. It'd be a terrible situation to be in. And thank God we have this living hope, but did we deserve it? Of course not. Because we also see there in verse 3 that we have this abundant mercy. I mean, how merciful God was to even give us this hope. We don't deserve this hope at all. The mercy and grace of God is unbelievable. I talk about it all the time. I pray about it every single day because it's just unbelievable. I mean, I can't take a breath. I can't take a step. I can't do anything without hope and mercy being there, without love 
without joy, without peace. People always chuckle because I say I feel like I'm wrapped up in a gray burrito. It's just completely engulfs me. I'm completely it's just hope is all over me. Grace is all over me. Mercy is all over me. And of course, being in Texas, we can understand a grace burrito. So, but when I think about this stuff, you know, and I see people, you know, sometimes I don't know about you. I feel like when I look at what's going on in our country, do you ever feel like you're kind of like on the outside looking in? You're like, what is going on? Now, I'm not going to get into all that because I don't like to get into politics and all that stuff. But I see people with no hope. You know, they're just putting all their time and energy in things of this world that will do nothing for them in terms of eternal security. They're doing all this stuff and it's not filling anything. It's not filling a void. It's not giving them hope. It's all just temporary. And they're just putting, and I think that's one of the reasons they put so much time and energy because it just takes up time and they don't have to think about it. <clears throat> and we have to be careful with Christians that we don't get caught up in that ourselves. It's real easy to do because it's just all, oh, I mean, we can't hardly help it. But we kind of have to be like when Peter was walking on the water, as long as he looked at Jesus, he was doing great. But when he looked at the wind and the waves and he started sinking. Well, we have to be careful about us as Christians looking at the wind and the waves because it'll take us away from the Lord and we won't have that close relationship we need. We need to make sure we stay focused on Him. That's all that really matters. So in verse 4, it says, To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you. So, when death comes, then what? Well, to those of us who have a living hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have a reservation. Now, where's our reservation? In heaven. Where it's incorruptible and undefiled. And you may think, you know, well, on this earth, I really have not ever had much of an earthly inheritance. I've seen people, man, they've gotten all kinds of money and stuff from people from inheritance. But me, personally, no, I haven't. I mean, Dixie and I, we can relate to that. So, we may not have much of an inheritance on this earth, but we know we have an awesome one awaiting us in glory. We know we do. And I look, when I look at this and I see that we have this reservation, it says we have a reservation in heaven for you. You have a reservation in heaven. A reserva think about it. You have a reservation. A reservation has been made for you in heaven. <clears throat> now, sometimes I forget about that. I don't really think, but if I can ever just grab that and just think, you know what, I've got a reservation waiting for me. So, Jesus said, see if you can fill in the blank. I go to prepare a place for you. Right. I go to pre prepare a place for you. Then he says, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, you may be also. So he has a reservation in heaven for you. <laughs> right, for you. So he has a reservation, but he's preparing a place for you. That where you may be, that where I may be, you, thank you Alex, may be also. Now think about that for a second. If I'm going to have people coming to my house, and say they're going to spend a couple nights, then I'm probably going to get a room ready for them because I know they're coming. And when Jesus says, I have a reservation for you, and I am preparing a place for you, you know what that means? He knows you are coming. It's not you might be coming, you may be coming, you are coming. You are going to be. He knows you're going to be there. 
Hey, man, rest in that. Realize what you have. Realize you have this reservation. Do you think I'm trying to get it through to your head that you have a reservation in heaven? Unbelievable thing. You know, one day, and this is, this is, I don't know how this stuff works out. You know, it's just like Dixie and I, we were in Jerusalem on our 40th anniversary, okay? So that was an awesome thing. 40 years in the wilderness, and now we're, we were in the promised land. I, Dixie was doing well. I, would, I guess I was in the wilderness wandering around. But I made a reservation. Get this. This is, I, I don't know how to plan. I, can, I didn't plan this. But my reservation was made 41 years ago today. 41 years ago today, I made a reservation. And that reservation was made when I got on my knees and made a phone call. A phone call to Jesus and I said I'm a, say, I'm a sinner and Jesus I know you died for me and you were buried and rose again come into my heart and forgive me my sins and in that moment I mean in a twinkling of an eye it's not just the rapture in the twinkling of an eye Jesus said I have a reservation in heaven Whew, getting choked up for you in other words my name is written down in the Lamb's book of life that's my reservation. So, our inheritance is not going to be corruptible or defiled, and it will not fade away. If I have an earthly inheritance, I can't take it with me. It's corruptible. And only what we have in God through Christ will not be corruptible and will not be defiled and will not fade away. Hey, you can't even say, you can't even say that, the, you know, think about this, the earth, stars, planets, people, all of existence cannot say it will not fade away. Nothing else can say it will not fade away. It all will fade away except for these things of God. So, I may not have an earthly inheritance, but that's okay because I have a godly inheritance, a reservation. This is very important as we go through this, that you remember you have this reservation. So verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So who are kept? So who is who? Sounds almost like a Dr. Seuss thing. <laughs> who is who? Who is who? Well, who is talking about those of us that have a reservation. That's who he's talking about. And how would he know that we have this reservation? Well, it says, you're kept by the power of God. So there's a qualifier to this reservation. Because the reservation is not kept by us. It is kept by God. God and thank God for that. You know, I, I don't know if you ever imagine sometimes like, you know, how you, you have this thought like God's working on you, you're like you know, He's the potter, you're the clay, and He's doing all this stuff. And I think I'm so glad that it's God because it was somebody who had a human mind like mine. They would take me and eventually just throw me down. You know, I'd be a lump of clay with a flat part where they threw me down. Then they probably kicked me across from like I'm tired of messing with this guy. He's not, you know, it's like he just messes up here and messes up there, but you know what? Again, that's the abundant mercy of God and His grace. You know, He's so long-suffering, and I'm thankful for that every day. Every day. His patience is unbelievable. I mean, you know when you think about yourself, you think about you in human terms, you think about the person, you realize, you know what? I, man, I just mess up so much, but God is so patient with me, and He uses me, and He loves me, and He keeps working on me. It's just an awesome thing. So, what is our part then? God's keeping this for us, this reservation, but what is our part? Well, in verse 5, what our part is the fact that we have faith that God will keep that reservation. You know what? You can't go around doubting that. You have to say, you know what? When I accepted Jesus Christ by faith, I know without a shadow of doubt 
that from that point on, heaven was my home. I have this reservation. So you just have this faith that just says, you know what? I'm trusting God because he's the one who's keeping it. If I mess up, I can't think about myself in emotional terms like, oh man, I don't know if I'm going to go to heaven. I've... No, you're not keeping it. God is. It's not up to us. So we, we realized that by faith, we accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior. We knew we were going to heaven. We also realized by faith that it's the Father and the Son that's going to keep us. But it's the same thing that we, uh, by faith, that we realize how important it is that we know that we have this reservation in heaven, especially when trials come. It is so important to you to know that, hey, you know what? I have a reservation in heaven, and now I've got this trial, and knowing I have a reservation is going to help me get through this trial. To know that you have something waiting for you. Now, you've heard me say something about this before, but I want you to turn just a second to the book before this, James chapter 1. Because I think it's really important with what he's going to talk about in verse 6 in 1 Peter. And when I was teaching this probably a couple years ago in Home Bible Fellowship, it just, I mean, the Holy Spirit just spoke to me in a certain way about this thing that I'd never thought of before. And I have taken it and just kind of, anytime I'm going through something, I just take it with me and just remember and say, this is what I've got to do. So in James chapter 1, verse 2, It says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, I'm gonna, not going to get into the joy part yet. I will. But count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So what's being tested? Your faith. What's it going to produce? Patience. Patience in what? And the fact that you heard the word hoopamoni all the time that we remain under. In other words, we are just going to trust in Jesus. I'm, no, I'm going through this trial. I'm trusting in Jesus through this entire thing. I'm just going to put my faith in Him. And He's going to see me through it. But then it says, but let patience have its perfect work because if you trust in Jesus, you stick with Him through this thing, hey, it's, you're gonna, He's perfecting you. He's trying to get you from point A to point B to point C to point D in your Christian life. So as you trust in Him, that this patience have its perfect work and you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That's what he's trying to do with you through this. And they're various. And he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, if you're going through a trial and you're like, you know what? Man, I'm not sure why this is happening. You know, what's going on, Lord? You know, just help me. You know, give me some wisdom here. Help me to understand this. So if you lack in wisdom, let him ask of God. Not a counselor. God. Who gives to all liberally and without reproach. And it will be given to him. It will be given to you if you are asking by faith. That's a key word. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. So if you ask God and he tells you you should do something or you just feel the Holy Spirit telling you what you should do and you go against it and decide to do your own thing, well, you know what? You're going to be tossing and turning at night. You can be all kinds of stuff and you'll be a spiritual, physical, and emotional mess. That's what will happen. Not only that, out of that in the next verse, verse 7, let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. You will get nothing out of this. Your faith is supposed to grow. Your patience, your trusting in the Lord is supposed to grow. But when you decided to do yourself, you got none of that. And so when the next trial comes, you are not going to count as joy. You're going to say, I hate this. I don't want another trial. God, why are you doing this? I don't understand this. I quit. I don't want to do this no more. That's what is going to happen. And it says he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. But you do it God's way, and you let him work through you and through this trial, when it's over, you will have grown in your faith, 
and in your patience and trusting Jesus Christ through each trial. And you'll get stronger and stronger. And what will happen, it's just like a loop. You go through the trial, you go through it, and then the next trial comes and you go through it. And each trial you're like, okay, I remember what God did. I remember how he got me through it. I remember what I had to do. And now I'm just going to trust him and go through it. And now I've grown some more. And, now, and it just keeps going. You keep growing, you keep growing, and you keep growing, and you keep growing. Now, I have a problem sometimes with how people try to describe this joy. I mean, I've heard people say, you know, pastors are like, hey, you know, it's just like you have a flat tire. Ha, 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 praise God. No, I don't think that's what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not going to get off too terribly upset if I have a flat tire. It's not like the worst trial in my life, you know, or anything. But... I want you to listen to this. We're going to go back to 1 Peter, but listen to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Don't turn there. You all know this, most of you. And it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I like that. The author and finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now listen. Jesus did not regard the cross itself as joy. I don't see him laughing and having a good time in the Garden of Gethsemane. Did you? Didn't think so. <clears throat> but there was joy in doing the Father's will... There was joy in knowing what it was going to mean to mankind once it was accomplished. And once it was accomplished, there was joy in knowing that he was going to be back home with the Father. Okay? So there's this joy. It's not like you're acting silly. There's this joy. You have this inner joy, this peace. And we're actually going to talk about that a little bit further. I don't get too much into it. But you think about this. When you have this joy... You're going through these trials, and as you've been through them a few times, you're, you're like, okay, I've been through this. I know what to expect. I know I can trust in the Lord. I know He'll get me through this thing. And so you have this anticipation of like, you know, it may not be fun, but I know when it's all over, I'm going to appreciate it. There's something that's going to come out of it. I'm going to learn something. There's like this, this peace that you have inside of yourself. Do you know God will see me through it? And I'll be a better person as far as a Christian and person living for Jesus Christ. That's the joy. And <clears throat> that is why when we're going through this, that the reservation is so important. Because as you're going through this, and you're going through this trial, you go, you know what? I mean, I think, you know, I talk about Mary. I also think about Mark. I think about lots of people. Richard. A lot of people. I think about all these people are going through these trials, and it may not be much fun, but they know that someday this is all going to be over because they have a reservation. They're going to be in their heavenly home. So that can give them that joy and that peace. So now this kind of ties in with verse 6. So back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. So... It's kind of interesting that he starts off by saying, in this, you greatly rejoice. He's going to start talking about trials. James says, count it all joy. He says, in this, you greatly rejoice. When it's all over, hey, you're going to rejoice, and you're going to see what I'm talking about here in just a second. But Peter says, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Huh. It doesn't mean you have to go around and act like you're some kind of superman and you're going through a trial and you have to pretend like nothing bothers you. Oh, God take care of it. I'll be just fine. It's okay to cry. You know, it's okay, as we saw here, to grieve. I've said before, it's not okay to freak out and act like there's no God and you've got to do it yourself. I've done that. 
I'm sure we all probably have, but I'll admit it, I've done that. So, we're not some kind of robot, you know, just go around acting like, you know, hey, I'm perfectly fine, nothing bothers me, I'm going through a terrible trial. No. And sometimes we act like Jesus is like that, like he's some kind of superman, he didn't feel anything. No, that's not true. I mean, he was troubled in his spirit in the garden. He was troubled in knowing what was going to be the end result of Judas Iscariot. It even says that. It troubled his soul. He didn't like what was going to happen to Judas. I mean, he washed his feet. He put him. He was in the place of honor. He gave him the first uh, piece of bread, the sop, which was also a, a thing of honor. He did that all for him, and Judas still betrayed him. We can't say Jesus didn't try. He cared. But there are th things in this life that are going to cause us hurt and pain. And just like James, Peter said the same thing. They both said various trials. Both of them did. To both of the people they were speaking to. You know, I mean, it'd be great. Like, okay, I made it through my one trial. Whew, man, I made it through. Now I can tiptoe through the tulips all the way to heaven. I'm in great shape. So, and it just doesn't work that way. It says we're going to have various trials. But I saw something. I don't remember where I saw it. But it said various trials literally means a many colored robe like an embroidered robe. Now think about that. You have this robe that's embroidered in many colors. Okay? And each color in that robe is a trial. Now, I don't know about you. I mean, I don't have to have the robe, but if I had the robe, with or without, when I look back at what God has allowed me to go through and brought me through, there's something special about that. I mean, I think some of you, if you really think back to things God has brought you through, you just think, man, what an awesome thing. When I think back, you know, at the time it wasn't so awesome, but now I look at it, unbelievable. And if we could actually just sit there and look at this robe, you know, you'd look at these different pieces and you think, I remember this piece I remember what God did for me in this trial and what he did to bring me through that and, and what I learned out of it and how I grew. And some trials, you will grow exponentially. Others, maybe just be a small thing. And I'd be proud of that robe because it wasn't made just by me. I had a part to play in it but I could see God's hand just leading me through each trial and each test with these colors. And that would give me joy. Count it all joy. That would give me joy. You know, we could almost say like that we, we are kind of like we're having on-the-job training, right? We as Christians, like we're just coming along like, okay, I've got... Something here that I, God's trying to teach me and I'm trying to learn. Hey, it's OJT. But I could see where he was working on me and he's trying to make me be more like him. And the thing is in the Christian life, you know, in every life, but even in the Christian life, you know, people are wanting to get to the good stuff. You know, kind of like the prosperity gospel slash motivational speaking, whatever. They want to get to the good stuff. But, to get to the good stuff, you have to go through the hard stuff first. And when you finally get through the hard stuff, you will actually get to the best stuff. Hey, when it was all over for Jesus Christ, where was he? He was back home in heaven. He was in the best stuff. He went through it. He went through it for us. Hey, it's not like he didn't go through a trial. He went through an incredible trial for us. So, 
We will have stuff that's better than good. But I noticed that when Peter says in here in verse 6, he says, for a little while. For a little while. So when you go through these various trials, for a little while you will go through this trial. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Mary will know what I'm talking about. But it's for a little while. You know, Dixie and I have said before that in our trial with our daughter that it was for a lifetime. But you know what? It may be for a lifetime, but it's not. We don't feel like we're in a trial all the time. God gives us peace. We're out of it. You know, and we know where she's going to be. We know where we're going to be. I mean, if it lasts me for 100 years, 100 years is still a little while, but you know, I'm not saying I want it to last for 100 years. I don't even want to be alive for 100 years. And I certainly hope that if I was, that the Lord came back long before I reached 100. So, but sure seems like he should be. But, you know, the trouble doesn't last. And it also says in there in verse 6, he also says, if need be. Think about if need be. If you, if it need be, if you are needing to go through a trial. God's saying, you need to go through a trial because I need to get you to a different place in your Christian walk. And Peter's saying, if you need be, you're going to have these various trials. They're needed. They're needful. We need these things. Whether we like them or not, we need them. <clears throat> now, Does God ever have to talk us off the cliff sometimes? <laughs> yeah. Usually when a trial starts, the first reaction is like we just kind of like we're jolted, right? We just kind of take a step back and like, oh, no, man. And you start kind of freaking out a little bit, you know. Well, maybe you don't, but I might. You know, I don't mind being transparent. But then you just, you just stop and you go, okay, all right. James 1, 2 through 5. I'm just going to, you know what, I'm just going to put my faith in God. I'm just going to trust in Jesus and stick it out with Him. And if I need wisdom, I'm going to pray and ask God for this wisdom to help me get through this trial. And I know that eventually He'll get me through it and I'll be where I need to be. So, and I've, you know, I've gone through a little bit of a trial. Aid, nothing serious. I look, to me, it's like it's minor compared to some people. I mean, I got laid off in June. I was told I'd get unemployment. I got denied 24 weeks of unemployment. I had cancer in my nose that they took off. And uh, that was not fun. And yes, there was times I was probably on the cliff. But, you know, hey, God talked me back off. And I have complete peace. You know, praise God. It's not because of me. It's because of God. Now, I want to say something. This is kind of like a side note for free. John 14, 6, we all know this says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto me. I mean, excuse me, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And we know that's for salvation. We know that. But when Jesus said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me, that's also for prayer. You understand that? A little farther in that same chapter 14, Jesus said, whatever you ask, ask in my name. And the reason I'm bringing that up to you, I mean, prayer to me has always been a huge part of my Christian life. Because I had people to pray for right away when I got saved. And, and I'm thinking about Daniel. Daniel, you know, we've been talking about Daniel on Wednesday nights. Think about Daniel. He's taken away to a foreign land. Okay. Is he able to go to a synagogue and hear the word of God anymore? No. But he has one thing. He has prayer. And he used it three times a day. I'm not saying that. But what I'm trying to say to us as the body of Christ here at Calvary Chapel Flower Mound, online, here in person, is I like to, us to be a body that are just powerful, intercessory, war, prayer prayers. I would like to be, a, you know, because we're to pray for one another. And I like us to be a people who look around and see who can I be praying for. And you don't really have to look that hard. 
You just have to take your eyes off of yourself and your prayers and start thinking about other people. I mean, you think about, I mean, Mark, uh, Mary, Richard, Sarah with her job. Um, I think of uh, Warren and Robert. Both their backs have been bothering them. I think about our pastor and his wife that they need. I mean, we have prayer. We, if you just pay attention, there are people all over the place that are needing your prayers. And if you pray for them, don't be afraid to walk up to them and say, Hey, you know what, Mary, I've been praying for you. That's not bragging. And when you tell a person that, what it does is it encourages them. Like, thank you for praying for me. You know, I had people tell me, hey, Brian, I'm praying for you for tonight. That encouraged me. I need that. And so that was a blessing to people. Prayed for me when I had my surgery. That was a blessing. And by the way, in that surgery, God answered every single thing in that prayer. It was unbelievable. Because I know that they can keep trying to take it off and take it off till they get it all. I was like, Lord, please get them the first time. The doctor walked in there and said, I'm having a bad average today. In other words, she was not getting people on the first time at all. And I was just like, oh, okay. So I'm laying there and they put you on your back and they put these pieces of paper over your eyes because when they put the needle in there to numb it, they said it can shoot out of the pores. And so they squeezed my nose and stuck that in there and pushed it in there. And if I could have generated electricity and they had hooked me up, I could have kept them in electricity probably for the whole day. Because I probably I was just like, I was probably, because usually I don't care about shots. I just ignore them, don't pay attention. But that straightened me up, man. I tell you what. And, but she came back within an hour, much faster than normal, and said, we got it the first time. I was like, thank you, God. Thank you for hearing my prayer. I mean, literally. And she said, okay, we're going to have to stitch it now. And I said, do you have to give me a shot again? She goes, yep. <laughs> I was like, okay. But it was so fast that it was numb, I didn't feel it. And I was like, thank you, God. You worked through this thing. And, man, so I had eight stitches on top, four underneath, four still there that will eventually dissolve. But God saw me through it. And when I found out I was not going to get any unemployment for 24 weeks, well, at first, we were like kind of, you know, freaking out. And Dix was like, do we need to sell our house? And I said, no, not yet. Because I've prayed that God would put Dixie and I in sync, that as we pray about this, God would give us wisdom to know what it is we're supposed to do. And every time I would think about selling the house and looking, I'd have no peace. And that told me right there, God's saying, no, don't do anything. Just wait on me. Just relax and take it easy and just let life go day by day. So I thank God for that. So pray for one another. Do that. So verse 7. We're only going to verse 9, by the way. Verse 7. So it goes on and says that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, Though it is tested by fire, it may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, you know, I've always said there are things that, you know, at least I've always thought, there are things I can have great faith in, like, oh, this has happened to me. Oh, no problem, man. God will take care of this. Oh, you other people, well, you don't have any faith. What a bunch of losers, you know. It's like, come on. <laughs> but... I don't usually say that, okay? I'm just joking. But anyway, something will come along that all of a sudden I have no faith. I mean, I'm just in shambles and I'm doing terrible and I'm like, man, I never, I don't know what to do here. And usually, I'll be transparent again, it involved money. And I think almost all of us could say the thing that we might struggle the most with in our faith usually it relates to money. So, I would rob Peter to pay Paul. You know, that was my faith. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to apologize to Peter and Paul. But, that'd be me. It took me a long time to finally get over that. I mean, when we were not going to get our unemployment, I got laid off. I was like, hey, I'm just trusting in God, man. He's just going to take care of this. That's not me. That is not normal. Okay? I'm an abnormal person normally. That's not normal. So, but the thing I have to ask you is this. How do you know 
what kind of faith you have when you're tested. The thing is, you won't know. You don't know what kind of faith you have until you are tested. People have said, you know, I've heard people say about people that are in a situation like, man, I can't believe what they went through. I never could do something. I, I, I couldn't make it through something like that. You don't know. God gives you the grace when you need it, not before. If you don't need it, there's no point in giving it to you. Not until you need it. And you know, when it happens, you'll be surprised at what you can handle in the Lord if you stay close. And that is a key. You need to have a close relationship with God. When you have this relationship, you can handle it. If you're out here and a trial comes, look out. You're going to be in trouble. But if you're right here and you have this trial and it comes like, okay, I kind of feel like I have the heart and mind of God and I've been trying to have a relationship with Him and now this trial is coming and now I feel like you know, I can really trust God like I need to. I can understand it a little bit. <clears throat> you know, I don't pray God give me a trial so I can find out how much faith I have, okay? Now, some people may say, well, Brian, that's not right. You probably should pray. Well, you go ahead and pray that, okay? You can go ahead. I don't pray that. What I pray and try to do is have that close relationship so that when it comes, I'm ready for the battle. That's what you have to do. You know, we hear a lot of times about putting on the armor of God in Ephesians 6. But in Ephesians 6.10, it says this, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. So, you kind of have to have verse 10 before you can get to the rest of the verses and put on that armor. It's not like you're going to have a soldier or a guy come in and he's going to join the army or something and say, All right. Here I am, and they gave him a helmet and a uniform and shoes and a gun. And the sergeant says, okay, soldier, get out there and fight him. You'd be like, what? I don't know what I'm doing. What do you want me to do here with this gun? And I don't, no, you wouldn't send him out there like that. And you wouldn't have a soldier come in there and say, yeah, I'm pretty skilled. You know, I, you know, I've shot a lot of people in video games, you know. And then the sergeant would probably have to say, well, you know, one thing unlike a video game, if they shoot you and kill you, you're not coming back alive to shoot more people. You're dead. Okay? No, you have to be prepared. You know, you have to be trained. You know, the soldier may say, I need some instruction. Don't send me out there without instruction. We need this. We need to be prepared in order for us to be able to handle the battle, to have on the full armor of God. So, when it happens, when the trial does happen, and you may not want it to happen, but when it happens, well, what's it going to take? Well, we see in verse 7, it says, the genuineness of your faith. You're going to need genuine faith. Genuine faith. <clears throat> so, it's going to be real faith in God alone. Nothing added, no schemes of your own, no robbing from Peter to pay Paul, none of that stuff. Completely just trusting in God. And that genuine faith, we're told, is more precious than gold. It'll go through the fire to the glory of God. The riches, the things of this earth, it will not pass through the fire. It's not going to get you through what you need. You're going to need genuine faith. <clears throat> and, you know, riches, they're not going to fill the void. They're not going to take care of the problem. Now, some people will be like, well, I wish, uh, you know, if you, Lord, you give me a million dollars, I could prove you wrong. I'll be give you 50% and I'd do this. I mean, I think I used to say things like that when I first was a Christian. Like, well, God, help me win, you know, this huge lotto or something, and I'll do whatever. And No, most likely my trust and my reliance upon God would have faded over time. God knows what I need. I don't know anything. So, and the thing is, the riches, they're corruptible. And corruptible things cannot enter into heaven. Only the things of God. 
So, when it is all said and done, things like our faith, as I said, will pass through the fire to the glory of God. And the thing you have to understand is that your faith, think about it, your faith is a testimony to others for the glory of God. Your faith is. I mean, think about that. When you're going through a trial and you have great faith that your God is going to get you through that, people are going to see it. And it's going to be people who are saved and people who are not believers. Hey, a believer may see somebody going through. They may see you in tears. They may see you grieving. But they also know you have this great faith like, I know God's going to get me through this. Even though I'm grieving, I know God will get me through it. I know that I'll learn. And people will see that and say, you know what? I want to know that person's God. Your faith is a testimony. Don't ever forget that. I was hearing a story by a pastor. He said uh, him and his wife were at LaGuardia Airport in New York. It was in the nighttime, and all of a sudden, all the electricity went out on the eastern seaboard. It was just pitch black. He called the secretary, said, I need a room at a hotel. They got a room. There was hardly any left. He went into the hotel. It was just candles and flashlights. Everything else was dark. They got up to their room. They were at the Crown Plaza, and they looked across to the Marriott, and it was all lit up. They're like, what's going on here? So they went over there and said, how come you guys have all these lights? Everything was just as it always is. And they said, we bought these generators a while back to make sure that if anything like this happened, we'd be able to have electricity. So the Marriott had a power source that was not dependent upon what was going on around it. They had a power source regardless of the circumstances around them. I think you know where I'm going with this. We have a power source in Jesus Christ. We should be a light in darkness regardless of the circumstances going on around us. Even in the middle of darkness, even in the middle of hard times, 100% of the time, we always have good news because we have a reservation in heaven. I mean, have you ever thought about Something I'm just going to read to you real quick. I won't go into in detail. But in Jeremiah, we know that was nothing but bad news, bad news, bad news, bad news. I mean, Jeremiah, poor guy. I mean, when we all get to heaven, we need to give Jeremiah a hug. I mean, the guy, I mean, really. What a, you know, what a job he had for God. It was not fun. But in the middle of bad news, bad news, bad news, bad news, you have Jeremiah 29 11, it says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Do you have a future and a hope? you have a reservation? And it says, Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Listen, you want to be a light in darkness? You want to be salt and light? You have a point when darkness is around you, you have the, the chance now to participate in the fact that you diligently now want to seek God and seek the face of God and know what it is He wants you to do and to be a shining light in the middle of that darkness. It doesn't have to stay dark. You can be the light. But it's going to take effort. It's going to take desire. Truly wanting to know God and be with Him and walk with Him. So, we have a reservation in heaven made for us. So, we saw good news in the middle of a lot of bad news. And that's always the case when Jesus is in it. And when we remain in Jesus, we will be a light to those in darkness around us, regardless of the circumstances. Why? Because we have a future and a hope. Now, verse 8. So now it goes on and says, he's talking to these Christians and to us, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with, re rejoice with joy inexpressible, 
and full of glory. Now think about who the Holy Spirit has just given to write this down. And to write down whom not having not seen you love. I mean, it's Peter. Peter saw Jesus for the three and a half years of his ministry. He saw him resurrect. He saw him go up. He saw, in fact, we're told that during Jesus' earthly ministry, Peter saw Jesus more than any other person. But yet Peter is saying to these people who have never seen Jesus, you know what? You love him as much as I do, and I've seen him. You guys haven't seen him. And I don't know, but I have a feeling Peter was probably like really proud of these people. Like this is really special. You know what? I saw him. My, my faith has a little bit to do with sight. Their faith is strictly just a spiritual sight based upon the Holy Spirit moving in their hearts. They saw Christ in that manner, not really in a physical appearance right there in front of them. And it goes on to says, you know what? The thing that's so unbelievable about this is that, <clears throat> well, before I go on with that, you think about the fact, all of us, all of us in here, every single one of us sitting here, at least I believe every single one of us, that we all, you know, we have this belief in Jesus Christ, even though we've never seen him. We have this love for him, even though we've never seen him. And I don't know about you, but this to me is a miraculous thing. It is so miraculous that you could believe in something this strong, but yet you have never seen him. And you know, 41 years ago today, when I walked into that church and for the first time heard that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, was buried, and rose again, that if I asked him to forgive me of my sins, that he would forgive me completely of all of my sins. Now I say two things came through my mind right then. First of all, I can't believe somebody loves me that much. They would die for me. And the second thing was I have so many sins, I can't believe anybody could forgive me of all those sins. And why, when I was sitting there, a person who was a skeptic, who said he was an atheist, argued against God, would be sitting there at that moment in time and hear this and not still be a skeptic and say, oh, come on. That is such a fairy tale. Don't tell me that Jesus came down, born of a virgin, died on the cross for my sins, was buried, that he rose again, and now he's back up in heaven, and he, you know, and someday I would be... Why was I still not a skeptic? I can't really... I could give you a bunch of spiritual you know, jargon or whatever, but in my mind's eye, and I can't fathom, I can't comprehend it. It's such a miraculous thing that why at that moment in time all my skepticism just flew right out the window and it's like, you know what? I want him as my savior. And you all know what I'm talking about. I don't care how old you were. When you came to Jesus, you had never seen him. And by some miraculous event of God and by the moving of the Holy Spirit, you said, you know what? I want him. I want him as my savior. But on top of that, we see that these people, their joy is inexpressible. They'd never seen him, but their love for him was so moving. I mean, they couldn't express themselves. And I know that this may have happened to you, but I don't know if you've ever been doing something, maybe you're reading your Bible or, or something's happened or you're praying or whatever, and all of a sudden you just have this overflow of love that just moves upon you and just comes inside of you and you just no, you can't contain it. You're like, I'd love to tell somebody about this, but I can't even put it into words. It won't even hardly make sense. But you know it, and you feel it. And here are these people. Are, Peter's just amazed. These people, they have this inexpressible love for Jesus. They can't explain it, but yet they have never seen him. And that's us. <clears throat> so... And when they're talking about can't, they've never seen him, Jesus could, you know, the Bible could also be talking about future, about Jesus returning. We know he's going to return. You know, that's by faith. We know he's coming back, strictly by faith. We've never seen him. We just know he said it and we believe it. So we have a past, what Jesus did for us, that we believe by faith. And we have a future. We know what, where we're going and what he's going to do for us also by faith. So we have both things. So we're covered, right? 
past, future, we're good. We have a future and a hope. So to end this in verse 9, So it says, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. So what is the end result? So here we go. Well, faith was in the very beginning when you placed your faith in Jesus Christ and believed what he did for you on the cross. That's where it started. So you realize your sins were forgiven. You made your reservation, right? So, the end of your faith, the thing that helped you through all your trials and your tests, is seeing what you had thought all of your Christian life would happen, and that someday you will be in, with Jesus in a complete place of peace. You'll be in your heavenly home. So, in other words, someday our faith will become sight. It'll be real. It'll be right there in front of us. Now, when I used to teach at a Christian school, I taught mostly high school science, but one year I had a 7th and 8th grade Bible class. And I would take a song out of the um, hymnals, because that's what we used at our church, and I'd tell them the history of this hymn, and they would put it in a three-ring binder, and then we would sing it. And each week, we added another song and another song. And after a while, we had enough songs that we actually, some days, we would spend the entire 55 minutes just singing. They loved it. Now, they're 7th and 8th graders, so the boys, you know, sometimes their voices would be high, low, cracking, you know, whatever. If you, know, you know where I'm going on that one. But... They loved it, but they were into praise and worship. But there was one song that even to this day, if I mention it to somebody, it's still one of their favorite songs. And I want to read this to you, so just listen to me as I read this true story. On November 21st, 1873, the French ocean liner, Ville du Havre, was crossing the Atlantic from the U.S. to Europe with 313 passengers on board. Among the passengers were Mrs. Spafford and their four daughters. Although Mr. Spafford had planned to go with his family, he found it necessary to stay in Chicago to help solve an unexpected business problem. He told his wife he would join her and their children in Europe a few days later. His plan was to take another ship. About four days in the crossing of the Atlantic, the Villa du Havre collided with a powerful, iron-hulled Scottish ship, the Loch Urn. Suddenly, all of those on board were in grave danger. Anna hurriedly brought her four children to the deck. She knelt there with Annie, Margaret Lee, Bessie, and Tanetta, and prayed that God would spare them, if that could be his will, or to make them willing to endure whatever awaited them. Within approximately 12 minutes, the village of Har slipped beneath the dark waters of the Atlantic, carrying with it 226 other passengers, including the four Spafford children. A sailor rowing a small boat over the spot where the ship went down spotted a woman floating on a piece of the wreckage. It was Anna, still alive. He pulled her into the boat and they were picked up by another large vessel which nine days later landed them in Cardiff, Wales. From there she wired her husband a message which, be which began, Saved alone, what shall I do? Mr. Spafford later framed that and had it in the wall of his office. <clears throat> Another of the ship's survivors, Pastor Weiss, later recalled Anna saying, God gave me four daughters. Now they've been taken from me. Someday I will understand why. Mr. Spafford booked the passage on the next available ship and left to join his grieving wife. With the ship about four days out, just like the Villa to Harv was when it had the collision, the captain called Spafford to his cabin and told him they were over the place where his children went down. According to Bertha Spafford Vester, which is a daughter that was born later, they had two daughters and a son, she said, Spafford wrote, it is well with my soul while on this journey. Now in the final verse, we read these words, and Lord, haste the day 
when my faith shall be sight. How could a person write a song entitled It Is Well With My Soul after something like that? Because of faith. The faith of what awaited him, he knew he had a reservation in heaven. I believe they must have known their daughters had a reservation in heaven. But we will see the end result of our faith. And how do we know? Because God cannot lie. And he has a reservation waiting. I mean, he's preparing a place for it. He's expecting us. It's not going to be a surprise. He is ex he's waiting for you for the day that you are going to be there. So, the faith that saved us will deliver us to where we knew we would be someday by faith. And even though we have never seen Jesus, yet we love him. Even though we have never seen he heaven, we know we will be there. And we know that Jesus will return someday. That's faith. So we have this incredible love for God that we cannot express, and by faith we know we have a reservation in heaven. And along the way we have this beautiful multicolored robe that is being made by God through the various trials that we go through. And this multicolored robe reminded me of something that deeply impacted me when I heard it. When we were in Jordan, we went to a mosaic shop. And it was a place where they were making them. And the Jordanian guide, he said this about a mosaic. It was a quote from Anne Graham Lott. And here's the quote about a mosaic. He said, she said, it is broken pieces that result in a beautiful picture. Admit it, we were broken pieces. We were. <laughs> but the result will be a beautiful picture. That will be the end result. So I pray that this will be an encouragement to you on your journey to your reservation in heaven. Let's go ahead and pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for being to be able to be here for your word. What a blessing your word is to us, God. And I thank you so much. I thank you even for the trials you've taken. I know they're not always fun. I know they can be hurtful. But we know that you're trying to do a good work in us. And God, we just prayed you just help us all that we will have a close relationship with you. That when trials come, that we'll be prepared for the battle and for what's to come. And that we will grow as you want, would want us to grow, to be more like your son. I pray that you be each person, that you watch over us and protect us and direct our paths. And we just pray also you'd help us to be prayer warriors for one another. I pray that you be with our pastor and his wife, that God, you watch over them, bless them, bless their time together. We pray that you be with him, you give him wisdom, power, and courage as he guides our church. And we just thank you, Jesus, for our salvation. And we thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. And we ask it all in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.